really delighted to be here to talk about some research which is joined with my colleagues Jean Pierre O'Mara, Bozalba Radic, and Slava Rokiki, who is here today. I'm Dr. Mark McGovern. I'm a lecturer in economics at Queen's University Belfast and the Centre of Excellence for Public Health. I'm particularly excited to talk about this subject because I'm very interested in the economic benefits of public health programs. And as a social scientist, I sometimes feel that the social benefits of population health are not as appreciated as they might be. And for reasons that we go on to discuss, I think breastfeeding is an excellent example of this. One interesting thing is that if you speak to the public health community, they will tell you that breastfeeding is known to have very important public health benefits. So there's a lot of literature linking breastfeeding to improvements in health for both women and for children. So this is quite interesting. And what we want to do today is expand on this a little by talking about the economic effects. This is also interesting from the perspective of Northern Ireland in particular, because Northern Ireland does not do well in an international comparison. So rates of breastfeeding are lower in Northern Ireland than they are in the Republic of Ireland and the UK. And in fact, that comparison is even a bit misleading because the UK and the Republic of Ireland in general do very poorly in international perspective. I'll show you exactly what the rates of breastfeeding are, but it, I think it is the right place to be studying the effects of breastfeeding. The other thing that I wanted to say in introducing this subject is that we're going to be providing estimates of the economic effect of, breeding, of breastfeeding, but that is not to say that those health effects are not also important. So you may well think that the health effects of breastfeeding alone are enough to justify investments in breastfeeding programs. But we want to complement that and we want to make the argument that actually, as well as those health benefits, there are also really important economic benefits. I think look, economic perspective is important for a couple of reasons. One of them is that we need to think about how we allocate resources. And if we can demonstrate that breastfeeding intervention programs provide an economic return, that provides an argument for diverting more resources to those type of programs. So we want to compare the economic benefits as opposed to other possible public health intervention strategies. I also want to say that what we want to do here is provide women with the best possible evidence on the costs and benefits of breastfeeding. We want to support them fully in that choice. So we want to give them all the evidence and let them decide the best decision for themselves. I think when we look at the data, there are are a lot of surveys which indicate there are many more people who would like to be breastfed, but they aren't fully receiving the support that they, they need to do that. And if that involves some economic resources, again, having the estimates of the economic effects can help us understand whether we need to divert, divert more resources to those programs. Getting back to the information that we have on breastfeeding in Northern Ireland, the latest data that many of you will probably be familiar with, looking at the Northern Ireland Child Health Reporting System says that 46% of babies receiving any breast, uh, breast milk on discharge, with 21% receiving a breast milk at three months. So as I mentioned, this compares not very favorably to other locations. Even in um, the Republic of Ireland, those figures are 53%, excuse me, 58% and 35%. If we look at um, six months, the picture is even worse. So here, only 13% of babies uh, are being breastfed at six months, compared to 34% in the UK as a whole. And if we look at a country like Norway, it's 71%. Why does this matter? Well, because of the benefits of breastfeeding. And if we compare this to, say, Norway, you see that breastfeeding rates are much, much higher there. So for example, in Norway, at six months, 71% of, of uh, babies are exclusively breastfed. You've already heard, if you're not aware of this, that the World Health Organization recommends that there's exclusive breastfeeding for the first six months and then potentially continued breastfeeding um, for two years and beyond. What we'll see when we look at these data, these are the averages for Northern Ireland as a whole, but there are important disparities within Northern Ireland. So for example, breastfeeding is concentrated among more advantaged areas. This is data from a recent public health report by the Public Health Agency, and it's showing you rates of breastfeeding at different ages for children, according to the, how well off the neighborhood is that the mother lives in. So for example, down at the bottom here, this is 
the most deprived, what are called SOAs. These are essentially small areas uh, where measures of deprivation are, uh, are measured. And if we look at the bottom quartile, quintile and the top quintile, you see big differences according to all these different ages. So for example, if we look at discharge, 31% of babies who live in the most deprived areas, 30% are breastfed at discharge from hospital, whereas in the least deprived areas, that figure is 60%. So the difference at discharge is more than double. Now, in fact, this difference persists at each of these different ages up to 12 months and beyond. So the patterning of breastfeeding is very much according to the, how well off your parents are. So this matters if breastfeeding conveys advantages for women and children. Because if opportunities to be breastfed are not equally distributed across the population, then the people who are gaining the most from breastfeeding may well be those who are already most advantaged. And as we'll show later on, if there are effects which last across a lifetime, you can even have spillover effects from one generation to the next. Now I want to say a little about what the evidence says on those benefits. So starting off with, with health. Again, this is quite helpful because a recent um, Institute for Public Health report summarized a lot of this information. And they said there was strong evidence to suggest that breastfeeding has a protective effect for children on the following conditions. So for example, ear infections, respiratory infections, uh, sudden infant death syndrome, and childhood overweight. So babies who are breastfed are less likely to have these conditions. But it's not just the children, it's also the mothers themselves. For example, breastfeeding is associated with a reduction in the risk of type 2 diabetes and breast cancer. If you're wondering how big these effects are, there was an extraordinary study which tried to estimate what would happen if breastfeeding was scaled up to near universal levels on a global scale. And these, these analyses found that the effect is so large that having this universal breastfeeding would save 800,000 child deaths per year. So that's the magnitude of these health effects that we're talking about. That's 800,000 child deaths, and in addition, 20,000 uh, breast cancer deaths prevented in women, again, per annum. So the magnitude of these health effects are enormous. It's also important for child development. We'll say a little bit more about how we know that these effects can be measured later on, but for now, let me just say that the evidence that we like comes from randomized control trials. And we do actually have evidence from randomized controlled trials which look at whether children who are breastfed are more likely to achieve their developmental potential. For example, one study we have comes from a very large trial which was conducted in Belarus. What happened here is that some hospitals in this country were randomized to a breastfeeding promotion intervention. So women who had babies in those hospitals received additional support for breastfeeding. So this was a randomized controlled trial and we were able to track the children as they grew up. And what we found was that the children who had been born into those breastfeeding hospitals and received uh, this large increase in exclusive breastfeeding, they had higher IQ at six and a half years when it was measured. So because this is a randomized controlled trial, this is good evidence that breastfeeding improves brain development. We also know a bit about how that occurs. So we have information on the biological mechanisms from another randomized control trial. And in this other RCT, the second one here, what happened was that there were mothers who wanted to breastfeed but had difficulty doing so. They were randomized to different conditions, one of which was that they received um, breast milk. And again, because this is an RCT, it's nice because it lets us be more confident that the effect that we're going to measure is due to breast, the breast milk alone. And what we found was that the children who received the breast milk in MRI scans, breast milk was found to promote brain development through a white growth matter, which is important for uh, cognition, in a dose-response relationship. So essentially, the more breast milk that a child received, the better was their brain development. So this is the evidence on the mechanisms through which we think breastfeeding affects uh, childhood cognitive development. Now let me move on to the economic effects. So these are the health effects. We also want to say, well, 
we know that we expect health improvements, do we also expect economic improvements? And there has been previous research on this. In particular, there was a recent report by UNICEF UK from 2012, which tried to examine this question from one particular perspective. And the perspective they took was, well, we know that breastfeeding improves health, and we know that going to hospital, buying medication, seeing your GP has costs. So what we're going to do is we're going to try and measure how much cost savings we would expect there to be if breastfeeding rates went up. So for example, the modeled breastfeeding effects would lead to reductions in costs associated with fewer GP consultations, hospital admissions, and expenditure on medication. And they modeled this for the UK as a whole, and they found that because of those health effects, they would expect moderate increases in breastfeeding to save 17 million pounds per year. And that is via reductions in those infant health conditions that I talked about, like uh, respiratory infection. Add in the savings associated with reductions in breast cancer, and you need to add 31 million pounds per cohort of first-time mothers to that 17 million. So this is purely economic savings associated with these health effects. Let's say now a bit about what we have done. So in our research, we try, instead of measuring the health savings, we want to measure the economic effects directly. Essentially, what we want to do is we want to measure whether an individual who is breastfed goes on to have higher earnings when they reach adulthood. And to do this, we will take something called the NCDS, which is the National Child Development Study. And it's a survey which tracked a representative sample of babies born in England, Wales, and Scotland in 1958, and it has tracked them across the life course. So they are now in their 60s, and we have data collected from them in 2008 when they were 50. And what we're going to do is we're going to take the babies who were breastfed in 1958 and see whether they have higher earnings now. And this is a nice survey because there's a lot of information on the background of these children from the time, and it has a lot of information on these children now when they're adults. So for example, we're going to be able to measure their household income, but we're also going to be able to measure their cognitive memory skills. And we know from 1958, at, in 1958, the mothers reported whether they were breastfeeding. One last thing that I wanted to say is that there are now 9,000 individuals among whom we can measure this effect. And we have this breastfeeding information and it's defined as whether the mother breastfed for a month or more. So this is something which is uh, given to us in the data. And 43% of children in 1958 in this cohort were breastfed. Let me show you some of the data. First on memory scores. Now this is information comparing here on the left, children who were, breastfed, who were not breastfed in 1958, this is their memory score now, versus children who were breastfed in 1958, this is their memory score now. So this information is measured in what we call standard deviation units. The average in the population is zero. So if you're above the line, it means you have above average memory. And if you're below the line, you have below average memory. What we see is that those who were not breastfed have below average memory because they have a minus around minus 0.1, whereas those who are breastfed plus 0.2. So there's already evidence that memory scores are better for those who are breastfed. I'll tell you exactly what these differences mean in terms of magnitude in a moment. Next, we looked at their household income and we measured the average household income again of those who were not breastfed in 1958. This is their current household income, weekly household income at age 50 versus those who were breastfed. And again, we see a difference. Just to be clear here, there's no modeling going on here. This is purely the average in one group versus the average in the other. So the average among those who were not breastfed, 588 pounds, versus 708 pounds per week among those who were breastfed. So again, direct evidence of some association between breastfeeding and earning higher incomes. Okay, so those are just what we would call an association. If you're thinking about policy and whether we should be diverting more resources into breastfeeding programs, what we really want to know is, do improvements in breastfeeding cause increases in income? So is this a causal relationship? There's a couple of ways that we 
we can think about this. In social science, we don't often get to do randomized controlled trials, but in a way, that's the ideal evidence because it lets us rule out alternative explanations for the results that I showed you. Unfortunately, we can't wait to do a randomized trial. The data that I showed you, these are 50 years later. So even if we started a randomized controlled trial today, we would have to wait 50 years for the results to come out. I would be uh, 71, I would be retiring. So someone else would have to do the analysis. Plus we'd have to wait a long time. So we don't really have the option of an RCT. So what are the other ways that we can get at whether these associations I showed you are actually purely due to breastfeeding? So one thing that is helpful is to have an understanding of the mechanisms. So is there a plausible biological mechanism for this result? Well, absolutely there is. It's what I showed you at the beginning that breastfeeding improves brain development. And if that's the case, then we would expect to see some difference in income. So we do have a biological basis for these results. The next thing that we can do is try to adjust for alternative explanations in the best way we can. So one concern about this result could be that, well, you already told us that those who are breastfed are more advantaged in terms of socioeconomic background. So maybe this result is just due to that SES difference and not breastfeeding. But fortunately, this survey that I talked about has a lot of information on the background of these children. So we can adjust for these alternative explanations. So it turns out that those results as best we can tell, are not due to those socioeconomic differences or any other alternative explanation that you could uh, reasonably suggest. So we just for what we observe. The final thing is, well, what, are, what if there are alternative explanations that you can't measure? So actually, this is a situation where, in this presentation, I won't get into it too much, but the academic version of this paper, we worry a lot about this issue. So we spent a lot of time in the paper trying to rule out other explanations for our results caused by things which we can't measure. We do something called a simultaneous equation model. And as best we can tell, results that we're showing you are not affected by things we can't measure. So we think that there's good evidence that these effects are real. If there's anybody who'd like further information, I'd be delighted to talk about some of that statistical analysis later on. But for now, let me just show you our best estimates of the breastfeeding effects. Starting off here at the top, this is cognition. So these are memory scores at age 50. So you'll see 0.15. That 0.15 is telling you that children who are breastfed have 0.15 higher memory scores now. I told you that I would tell you what that magnitude means. And it's interesting because this magnitude is the same as the gap between children who were born to the least educated mothers versus the highest educated mothers. So if you, were, if you take that education differences, that education difference, you get exactly this 0.15 which already gives you a sense that the breastfeeding effect is comparable to other um, disparities that we see in social science. There are three stars here which is saying this result is statistically significant. The number here in brackets is a confidence interval. So these are estimates. We're not, we have to acknowledge that there's some uncertainty and so the confidence interval is a measure of, of that. Interestingly, we don't find any effect on processing speed. So memory here is asking people to recall different events and items that they're presented with. Processing speed is trying to measure how fast they can do tasks. So we don't actually see any association between breastfeeding and processing speed. The final one that we measure is the graph that I showed you, the second graph, which is household income. And this is measured in logs, which means that we should take this number 0.10 in terms of percent. So this is saying that children who are breastfed in 1958 have 10% higher household income now. So this 10% is really interesting. So as a social scientist, I was trying to think, well, what are the other social science interventions which have such a large effect? So that 10% is huge. So the only one that I could think of is an additional year of schooling. So we have something called ROSLA, which is the raising of the school leaving age. So this was something which mandated that children had to stay in school for an additional year. This happened right after World War II, and we think that the effect of that was the same, about a 10% increase in earnings. But let's think about this. The things that you need to do to do an additional year of schooling, it's very expensive for a start. So for example, government spending per child, or per pupil, I should say, in, in England is around 6,000 pounds per year. And that's not even the full economic cost, but let's, let's take that 6,000 pounds to get that 10%. 
The point is that breastfeeding intervention programs can, if they provide that similar 10%, can do so for so much cheaper. So that UNICEF UK report, they suggest that an additional breastfed child could be achieved for between 150 and 200 pounds. So that's compared to that 6,000 pounds spending per pupil for an additional year of school. So it already gives us a sense that the economic benefits that we get from a breastfeeding intervention program are likely to compare very favorably to other uses of, of public funds. Now this 150 to 200 pounds, that's the UNICEF estimate. I know there are probably many of you who are finding that pretty high. I should say this is the cost per, it's not the cost of enrolling a woman in a breastfeeding program, it's the cost that you, that's associated with getting an additional breastfed child. So it doesn't depend on just the numbers and the cost, it depends on how effective the program is. But even if you can achieve an additional breastfed child for much less than this, let's take this 200, because it's conservative in a way. Conservative in the sense that actually we can probably do even better. But let's take that 200. So take that 200 pounds and take that 10% that I showed you. So we're going to do some back of the envelope calculations to try and figure out, okay, so what are the implied economic benefits for something like a breastfeeding intervention program? Now this is We'll talk about the limitations of this in a second, but these are preliminary results, so we should treat this with caution. But let's say that that 10% increase in earnings applies across a 45-year uh, working life. And let's say that you earn the median household income in every year. So let's say £20,000 for argument. How much is that worth? So what we need to do is account for the fact that benefits in the future are um, less valuable, so we have to do something called discounting. But when we do that, we think that the benefits of breastfeeding are worth £45,000 to individuals today. So that's not including the tax. If you, if you say, I don't care about individuals, I only care about how much the tax man gets, the benefit of that to the tax man is £9,000. So the benefits of having one extra child in breastfeeding are pretty large. What if you were to say, well, okay, I'm going to try and achieve something for my program like an extra 10% of children breastfed in Northern Ireland. So there's around 24,000 annual births in Northern Ireland. Let's get an extra 10% uh, of those who weren't breastfeeding into breastfeeding. How much would that be worth in terms of benefits based on these calculations? So we estimate the, what we call the net present value would be 108 million per birth cohort. Or again, if you're only caring about the taxman, it's worth 21.6 million to the taxman. And this is per year. How does that compare to the cost? This is why I said, let's take that 200 and be conservative. What we see is that the costs are just dwarfed by the benefits. So for example, at that 200, getting those extra two, um, extra 10% of babies in breastfed, in Northern Ireland breastfed, will cost around 500,000 pounds. So the benefits are very large compared to the cost. So I think that the implied cost benefit ratios here are very large. We can actually think about how feasible this is in practice because the UNICEF UK report did a sort of case study where they looked at doing a very large scale program in, in Lancashire. So there they estimated that the cost of such a program would be for around that 500,000 uh, pounds in the first year with a recurring annual cost of 329,000 pounds. In their model, they're only looking at the cost savings associated with health that I mentioned. So they thought that the cost savings per year would be 355,000. So when you add in the estimates that we have, I think it makes the case even stronger. But even if you only want to take the cost effect, the uh, cost of illness analysis or our estimates, regardless, I think it's pretty clear that the potential benefits to breastfeeding programs are extremely large. Maybe this will come up in the Q&A. It's not really something that we put into the briefing, but the good news is we actually do know a lot about what type of programs are effective at raising breastfeeding rates. 
And again, there's a lot of studies, reviews, meta-analyses, which consider different types of programs. This is from the um, public health report that I mentioned, and it lists some of the characteristics of effective programs. For example, evidence dissemination, societal attitudes, scaling up some of these interventions, and of course, things like having the political will to do so and regulating breast milk uh, companies and advertising. But the point here is that it's not like we're not sure how to achieve this. I think the evidence, the international evidence, gives us some ideas about how to do this. I know from talking to some of you who are working with community organizations that you're already running lots of very successful programs at actually doing this on a local scale. As an academic, I always want to be careful and emphasize that the research that I'm doing is subject to a lot of uncertainty. So there are, of course, limitations associated with this. I want to make sure that I convey that. So in particular, those estimates that I showed you, the economic benefits across the life cycle, we need to do more work on that. We need to consider how earnings change across the age profile. We also need to take account that taxes will change as people age too. So those ones that I showed you there back of the envelope, they're not meant to be the final results. I already said that these data are not from an RCT. So we have to be careful. We've done the best that we can, I think, about trying to rule out alternative explanations for those uh, breastfeeding effects. But we're doing further work with other data to try and make sure that these are actually due to breastfeeding alone. External validity is important. Unfortunately, these children in the survey, none of them were from Northern Ireland. And yet I'm here talking about, about the context here in Belfast. So we have to generalize from this study to not only Northern Ireland, but also those were children born in 1958. We need to think through whether the same effects would hold for children today. So these are issues that we are we were bearing in mind when we're doing the analysis. And I know that many of you are interested in the breastfeeding effects, specifically whether they apply at different cutoffs. So for example, are the breastfeeding effects most important at three months, six months? How does exclusive compare to non-exclusive breastfeeding? I think these are all very important questions, which we're not directly able to answer with these data. Okay, so finally, let me wrap up. Even if the estimates that I showed you are broadly correct, this implies that the economic benefits of breastfeeding programs are likely to be really substantial, large in magnitude. And that's even before you account for the savings associated with, with health conditions. So when you add in the two combined, the fact that children who are breastfed are less likely to go to hospital, less likely to have uh, ear infections and so on, when you add that to the estimates that I showed you for um, household income, that implies that these types of programs are likely to provide a significant economic return to society. Because of the fact that we have some information on how to make breastfeeding interventions effective, I think this is therefore a really exciting type of public intervention that we should be thinking a lot more about. All right, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.